Over the past two weeks, 78 TRP members were gathered here in Geneva to conduct our second in-person review meeting since 2019. Next slide. Over 200 funding requests are expected to be reviewed in GC7 allocation period. Half of these have been reviewed by the TRP in the first half of 2023. In window two, we received 63 funding requests, including two iterations, 26 full review and tailored for NSP funding requests, 37 uh, project program continuation, focus portfolio and transition funding requests. You can see there the breakdown of the funding request 63 that came to TRP by component in, uh, in window two. Next slide. 61 out of the 63 window two funding requests have been fully recommended for grant making by the TRP, being deemed to be strategically focused, technically sound and poised for sustainability and impact. One funding request was iterated and one uh, component of an integrated uh, funding request was also iterated, resulting in partial recommendation for grant making. So in total, 97% of the funding requests coming to TRP were recommended for grant making in window two. Next slide. The TRP has recommended all matching funds uh, reviewed in window two, but we note that several countries still have to meet their matching funds uh, commitment during grant making. And that's something that we leave to the, to the GAC. So in total, TRP recommended 4.9 billion in funding for grant making in window two. Next slide. Next slide. There you see the breakdown of, sorry, go back one slide. You see the breakdown, one slide, sorry. Back, breakdown of matching funds that were reviewed and recommended. So a total of 104 million matching funds fully recommended for grant making in HIV prevention, TB, finding and successfully treating missing cases, incentivizing RSSH, effective community systems and response, and scaling up programs to remove uh, barriers in human rights gender. Next slide. So, as you know, the TRP does not necessarily expect to receive a perfect funding request, but at the end of each funding review, we conduct a qualitative assessment of the quality of the funding request that we review. TRP members in window two agreed or strongly agreed in 98% of instances that funding requests delivered strategically focused, technically sound responses that are aligned with the epidemiological context and have the potential to maximize impact, and in some instances, sustainability. Next slide. Specifically on RSSH, the TRP observed a strategic shift, observed that uh, funding requests demonstrated a strategic shift on RSSH in 85% of the funding requests that we reviewed, uh, which were recommended for grant making. This is uh, important to note that it's eight points higher than in window one, and 14 points higher than in GC6 overall, although uh, they still need to focus more on system uh, strengthening rather than system support. So I think that's good news there that we are beginning to see more investments going into RSSH. Among funding requests, which include investments in pandemic preparedness, the TRP saw that appropriate investments were being made, and we noted that in 77% of the funding requests that we, we reviewed, and that these investments are making an effort to complement C19 RIM. We had increasingly greater visibility into what is coming into C19 RIM to be able to compare against GC7. Although I must note, more needs to be done and TRP has actually started now to review uh, C19 RIM funding request together with the CTAC. Next slide. The TRP on uh, sustainability. We observed uh, substantive improvements in our funding requests are addressing sustainability in window two with 87% positive rating compared to 79% in window one. Value for money was also noticed to show some uh, noticeable improvement with 89% uh, positive rating in window two compared to 77% in 
in window one. Co-financing, we also saw some uh, reasonable increase of uh, improvement in, uh, in window two than in window one. But I must say TRP still doesn't have full visibility of co-financing. Uh, and that's something that we are in discussion with uh, the Global Fund Secretariat to the extent that TRP can be provided with additional information on co-financing. And when we get to the thematic uh, presentations, you will hear more from our RSSH colleagues on what we saw in domestic resource mobilization and commitments to co-financing. There was a significant shift from GC6 when the question, when the question which integrated sustainability and co-financing uh, was uh, noticed to be, to be positive. The score on community systems and response was however lower in, uh, in window one, but still broadly positive, than in window one, but still broadly positive. So again, here we see funding requests still emphasizing and focusing on community health workers, uh, which, we, which is important, but community health workers is not necessarily the same as community system strength. And so we really want to see a broader and more holistic uh, focus to community system strengthening and not necessarily equating community health worker programs to community system strengthening. Next slide. The TRP uh, saw a strong positive movement on equity in window two funding requests with 87% positive rating in window two compared to 77% in window one. Scores on gender also improved uh, slightly uh, from GC6 and human rights uh, uh, scores also uh, would say were relatively consistent with, uh, with window one, uh, but gender had much more progress compared to GC6. We, however, as you hear from our EHRG uh, feedback, that there's a lot more that needs to be done uh, on gender. Uh, we, we also uh, would like to report that TRP has started uh, reviewing uh, the gender equality marker, but we are not yet ready uh, to share what we found out of that, as we are still discussing with the secretary on how to analyze and the implications to, uh, to uh, applicants. With this, I'll hand over to uh, Raminta to take us through the thematic observations that are cross-cutting across all these 63 funding requests that we saw in, uh, in window two. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Ramento Shtukira. I'm one of two vice chairs of TRP. And there are four thematic lessons that we wanted to bring to your attention. And I will present the first two of them. Um, the first lesson is that we saw two sides of ambition across funding requests. On one hand, we saw examples of too little ambition. Um, and on the other side, we saw examples of too much ambition. So examples of too little ambition included, for example, for HAB, across quite few funding requests, limiting for exposure for flaxa scale of plans uh, that were only limited to specific groups, but not other, uh, some groups, uh, but not other key populations, scaling up in urban areas or only in capital city, but not elsewhere. We saw limited introduction also of innovative prep tools like ring or long acting injectable. Additionally, for HIV, we saw poor HIV cascade for children in several, in probably more than 10 funding requests with uh, little ambition to address that. Similarly, for TB, we saw unambitious targets, including on treatment coverage, on drug resistant TB detection, child TB case finding, TPT. Also, little ambition for decentralization of services for child TB and drug resistant TB. Um, across the three diseases, we saw examples where applicants planned lots of activities to increase case finding, yet those activities were not planning to increase target and, and uh, detection of cases and then treatment and, uh, and care uh, cascades. Um, furthermore, covering over gap of ineffective health system uh, was had seen too little ambition and, and doing that by increasing investment in uh, community health workers. On the other side, the examples of too much ambition where, for example, focusing on innovation and ambition but leaving out basics like management of uh, advanced HIV disease or obtaining people on treatment. 
highest impact interventions in several funding requests were not given sufficient attention compared to the new interventions. Uh, some uh, applicants uh, had ambitious lab strategies, but inadequate investments in lab infrastructure to support those ambitious strategies. And they had inadequate investment in equipment or human resource capacity. And we saw in quite a few funding requests that targets were not matching reality. For example, HEB had four cascades, uh, but at ambition testing targets, malaria uh, in settings with low uh, and C coverage. We saw, on the other hand, ambitious um, ITPT, sorry, IPTP uh, three targets in pregnancy. Uh, countries proposing scaling up injectable prep. Sometimes we're doing that while they did not have well-organized HIV prevention programs or oral prep delivery models to build on, or had weak existing ERT programs. We saw mismatch between ambition to adopt new tools and country readiness to use them. For example, for TB, some proposals include a deployment of digital X-rays with computer aided diagnosis, but in those settings, no internet to support uh, the use of artificial intelligence and no radiologist to interpret the films. Um, we saw quite few funding requests where applicants have a funding requests with the Global Fund Strategies language, in particular when it comes to gender, human rights and community, but that peppering of language did not translate into programs, and we saw big gaps um, in programs and budgets and ability to achieve what is mentioned using the Global Fund Strategy language. Next slide, please. So in this thematic lesson, we identified four um, recommendations, including some examples of good practice. One, Applicants and partners should not forget to prioritize and sustain core services when planning for new interventions, meaning that they should maintain PMTCT, condoms, linkage to treatment initiation and care from community-based active case findings before going to new uh, interventions. Secondly, applicants and partners should plan for readiness to adopt new tools, taking into account country context and health systems capacity. Thirdly, while the TRP is very much encouraging the ambition, it advises applicants to be realistic and more data-driven when setting targets in their funding request. That requires accurate gap analysis. That requires setting the right expectations about what global fund allocation can achieve and matching performance framework targets with what is achievable, ambitions, matched with what's in program, uh, programs, meaning like bringing really a high level of realism. Um, we could learn from several examples, from some model examples of good target setting in window two, and we identified, uh, provided three funding requests that were particularly good with that. First, Mozambique for HIV, TB, and malaria, which started with uh, really focusing planning in the national strategic plan and using that particular those plans to identify what domestic funding and what non-global fund uh, external funding will cover, and then identifying what the global fund will uh, have to cover, and being very clear that the remaining gap that remains after domestic funding, after non-global fund external funding and global funding goes into uh, par. And moreover, Mozambique used data uh, driven down to like looking at cost effectiveness analysis and, and link that, align that to funding request. For focus portfolio, we wanted to highlight Kazakhstan HEV, which had sharp focus on priority key populations, um, planned scale up of innovative interventions that have been piloted uh, by other countries, but not yet in Kazakhstan. In case of Tanzania, tuberculosis, um, they used assessment of diagnostic infrastructure, identified gaps, models, and estimations, and made clear split between what should be covered in allocation 
and pod. Next slide. And thematic lesson number two is about need for greater focus on collaboration among partners at country level. The TRP is concerned by weaknesses in partnerships and collaborations at the country level, resulting in suboptimal impact despite really big focus on partnerships in the global fund strategy. And we identify four of these concerns. One, evidence in several funding requests indicates that some countries um, don't have national leadership, for example, Ministry of Health really coordinating in-country partners effectively. Uh, what we saw, for example, fragmented support to national program implementation, inconsistent levels of salary for health workers, sometimes mismatch of packages um, of services across the programs, uncoordinated supply systems, and some in-country regions covered while others not. Secondly, the Global Fund recognized that the partnerships need to include the full range of donors, civil society, including communities, and private sector. However, evidence in a number of funding requests suggests that further coordination is required to center community-led and key population organizations in programming and implementation. The TRP review of impact of Global Fund investment was often limited by inadequate or insufficient description of activities and investments of external and domestic resources as documented in several annexes and documentation of the funding request application package. For example, funding landscape tables, program gap tables, and the newly in this cycle established, uh, introduced uh, RSSA Fourth. Private sector engagement in several funding requests was noted to remain suboptimal with inconsistent mapping of private sector activities, usually very much disease focused and not systemic. The TRP noted ambition to leverage private sector for domestic resource mobilization for long term sustainability. Next slide. And based on these observations, we developed um, recommendations to both applicants and to partners in secretariat. For applicants within the context of global fund investments, country coordinating mechanisms should take a greater role in coordination of the full range of partners and ensure stewardship of national programs. In order to fulfill this coordination role, CCMs are advised to maintain an up-to-date mapping of donors and supported activities from different sources. CCM should continue to meaningfully engage with the full range of communities and community-led organizations ensure, and ensure that there is investment in and utilization of community-led monitoring and community system strengthening interventions. Thirdly, future applicants in Grant Cycle 7 are requested to provide a complete picture of investments and activities of infantry partners in existing annexes to funding requests. When it comes to partners and secretariats, uh, here are two recommendations. First, in-country partners should support capacity building of government structures, first of all, ministries, to support, guide, and engage with private sector, with donors, with civil society, and other actors. They should also organize and support platforms that facilitate this collaboration. The Global Fund Secretariat should continue to build the capacity of CCMs to act as a key coordination platform. Uh, with this, I'm handing back to Jabal. Thank you, Raminta. And just a, a reminder of an announcement I should have made in the beginning. Um, please, uh, you can post your questions in chat. We will have a Q&A session right at the end, and the slides are also going to be shared after the session translated in uh, French and Spanish. There may be a little bit of a lag in getting the Spanish and French translations. Now, just building on uh, what Raminta has presented, you will notice that uh, TRP has actually started uh, mentioning some examples of uh, what we found as good or model uh, you know, areas in funding requests, which is something that I think is quite positive. Window two was good overall. 
with 97% of funding requests being fully recommended for funding because they were deemed by TRP to be strategically focused, technically sound, and really poised for impact. We are confident that there will be progress towards uh, uh, these uh, funding requests contributing to global fund strategic shifts. We're also positive that this funding request will translate to uh, impactful implementation. But we also still feel that uh, it requires all hands on deck, as we reported in window one, to translate these funding requests to, uh, to impact. We just want to share with you a few positive examples of what we saw as uh, strong in the funding requests that came to, to TRP in, uh, in window two. Across all diseases and across all funding requests, we really uh, saw deliberate use of a range of national data to guide selection of interventions. And this speaks to the gap that we, uh, we saw and the challenge that we saw in, uh, in window one on prioritization. We saw better differentiation, especially uh, uh, focus uh, and increased focus on, on uh, 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 focus in, uh, in focus portfolios with uh, an increasing attention being paid to, to key population and uh, vulnerable uh, populations. In HIV in particular, we began to see an increased uh, recognition of more key populations, like I said, and more focus on intersectionality, including but not limited to transgender and diverse uh, people, uh, women, uh, prisoners who inject drugs. So we really commend applicants uh, to uh, keep up this, uh, this focus, but also translate this from not just recognizing them in funding requests, but also allocating funding and actually translating to targeted programming. We saw greater prioritization and budgeting of advanced HIV disease, which was a gap that we saw in window one. Uh, so that's quite, uh, quite encouraging. Uh, and that investment across the, the continuum uh, the, the HIV cascades, uh, which is quite important and noticeable. In TB, we saw optimization of new diagnostic tools, including molecular tablature recommended uh, diagnostic tests, uh, computer aided uh, diagnosis. And we also really began to see much more targeted uh, use of uh, chest x rays for uh, diagnosis. So, that whole area around uh, uh, enhancing or optimizing uh, uh, TB diagnosis, uh, which was uh, noticed as a slight gap in, in window one is being addressed. We saw greater and better use of routine data supplemented by research to optimize programming. For malaria, uh, you recall in window one, we had really major issues around the prioritization with front loading of the commodities in year one and year two. Uh, we saw greater use in window two of data for stratification, for prioritization and targeting interventions. However, the uh, challenges uh, with funding envelopes being uh, restricted still remain. We saw more evidence of uh, using matchbox data to inform programming, but as my EHRG colleagues would remind me that uh, despite there being many assessments being done, the use of uh, data coming from these assessments, including uh, matchbox, uh, still needs to be uh, sharpened and uh, improved on. In EHRG, like I said, more gender, more uh, matchbox assessments being conducted with some funding requests using these or beginning to use these uh, assessments to guide programming. We saw greater recognition and I must under, underscore recognition of punitive legal environments is impacting across uh, access uh, to services, but real uh, uh, tangible practical efforts to address uh, these uh, punitive legal environments still requires a lot of attention, including advocacy at the highest levels. In resilient and uh, sustainable systems for health, compared to GC6, we saw that in window two, there was uh, an increase in uh, investments in RSSH and also an increase in investments in, uh, in, in quality of RSSH programming. RSSH investments are consistently in window two, synergistic with and complementary to C19 RM investments. Although, like I said in the beginning, uh, there is still greater need for that visibility to TRP, which we are actually enhancing by TRP now being involved in review of uh, C19 RM applications together with the CTAG. This is even uh, so uh, required when uh, uh, we, we noticed uh, this greater effort, uh, emphasis on RSSH investments, not only in RSSH priority countries, but across the board. We saw uh, greater optimization and uh, of investments in uh, integrated laboratory systems, integrated HMIS, and health product management systems. 
But as you'll hear from colleagues in the RSSH thematic uh, presentation, there's still a bit more that needs to be done. So with this, I'll pass on to uh, Robin for our uh, fourth and final thematic lesson across the funding request that came to window two. Thank you. Um, so my name is Robin Gorner and I'm the, the outgoing uh, vice chair of the TRP. Um, and it's my pleasure to present a couple of slides on the variable progress that we saw on sustainability. And this is particularly important because as Jabu mentioned um, in the last uh, couple of slides, we have been always looking at our funding requests through the lens of strategic focus, technical soundness and poised for impact. And throughout Grant Cycle 7, we've added in a fourth overarching criteria, which is to look systematically at every single funding request to see if it's poised for sustainability, wherever it is in, in its journey with the Global Fund as a funding instrument. Uh, so overall, we really were pleased to see a much greater focus on programmatic and financial sustainability, and we saw that in four key areas. The first is that programmatically, there were far more examples of integration across the three diseases. We did see more integrated funding requests presented, and we've mirrored that in the way we've been giving most of the feedback to applicants. But actually, at a programmatic level, we saw good examples of triple elimination and some examples of integration of HIV with sexual and reproductive health and rights services. We were also pleased to see a greater reflection on the role of communities in funding requests. Um, and that included deliberate introduction of public contracting, which some call social contracting, and I'll say more about that. However, there are continuing challenges in many countries around the legal structure for public contracting, and that is something that some of our funding requests were also addressing. Thirdly, despite the overall financing challenges, we were really pleased to see some examples of increasing domestic financing. Um, and we saw that interestingly across countries at different points in the development continuum, including in challenging operating environments. And we saw a large number of COE countries uh, bringing funding requests to window two. And in some of those we saw, for example, countries picking up a greater share of the commodity costs, even if it was not represented in direct finance in the budget. And then finally, in terms of the focus, we observed uh, promising examples on innovative financing, complementing global fund financing, such as building synergies with multilateral investments, virtual pooling, and other steps towards greater harmonization and alignment. That said, we did see some areas of concern related to sustainability, and we do look to applicants to take more concrete steps in a number of areas. The question of human resource sustainability is one that remains a challenge. Um, we are seeing public sector and uh, community health worker remuneration included in funding requests, but we are not seeing the transition plan to move that to domestic funding. In some countries, we were concerned by a lack of reliable information on domestic health expenditure. Um, we've already touched on the question of co-financing and that will be something we come back to. And the lack of adequate information on that is a concern to the TRP because it, it's challenging for us to make accurate assessments without full uh, information about that. But we're also concerned about uh, the lack of resource tracking at a domestic level. And that, of course, leading to inadequate planning for financial sustainability. And then finally, an area of concern is that whilst there are there is some evidence of investments in community systems and strengthening those systems, structural barriers remain and are incredibly important in a large number of the countries that we have reviewed. For example, those where the legal environment related to human rights or related to shrinking civil society space is challenging the ability uh, to deliver services. And the regulatory systems have not been addressed effectively to ensure sustainability, including through public contracting. We also note that in a number of environments where certain behaviors are criminalized or where human rights are challenged, some organizations cannot register or apply for funding and that hinders the impact and sustainability of funding. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we then have uh, six recommended, oh, sorry, could you please go back? Um, could you, thank you. So we then have six recommendations across four buckets of areas. The first is around this area of public and social contracting. 
We would um, recommend that partners and CCMs work with and support governments as they create an enabling environment and a national budgetary allocation for the establishment and implementation of public contracting. And importantly, that that be public contracting, which can be accessed by civil society, community-based and community-led organizations. Secondly, we look to the Secretariat <clears throat> excuse me, and technical partners to facilitate the exchange of learnings, importantly between implementing countries with varied experiences of public contracting. And we also look to partners in the Secretariat to continue to engage in community capacity building so that those community-based and community-led organizations are able to access government funding in a credible way through public contracting where it's available. In respect of human resources, we're encouraging the Global Fund Secretariat to be increasingly strict about circumstances in which the Global Fund approves salaries and top-ups and grants. Also, whilst we're ensured we're very keen to see the community health workers are adequately remunerated for their work, we also wish to recommend to the Secretariat that we require a time-bound agreement on how these salaries and the salaries for public sector workers will be correctly transitioned um, in, in terms of sustainability, including international budgets directly by government or through public contracting for community health workers. In terms of financial sustainability, we look to implementing countries to improve the visibility of financial sustainability through coordinated financial approaches at the country level. And this speaks to points around collaboration that Raminta um, spoke about earlier. We also particularly want to highlight the importance of tracking health expenditures and domestic finance for HIV, TB and malaria. And finally, at a programmatic level for sustainability, we look to the highest level of the Global Fund Board and Secretariat to use their diplomatic voice in line with the new strategy um, approach to engage with governments where hostile environments are a barrier to effective health programming, especially in respect of human rights and shrinking civil society space. Next slide, please. So now it's my pleasure to hand over to our five uh, focal points from the technical review panel to present their technical observations and recommendations. And first of all, we will turn to Naomi Berkshine, who is our interim focal point for equity, human rights and gender. Next slide, please. Thanks, Robin. I'm really here to be here, really happy to be here today to, to report back from the equity, human rights and gender expert group. Um, we've got six observations with linked recommendations. Uh, so overall, the TRP observed more funding request narratives recognising structural barriers to care and acknowledging that, that, that it is critical to address human rights and gender barriers in order to reach the last mile across all three diseases. Um, and as Jabu had pointed out, this, this was seen in an increased number of assessments. Um, worth remarking upon is in particular the malaria matchbox and gender assessments. Although, you know, the, the, these assessments are not yet consistently being used to inform programming monitoring and evaluation and budgeting. Um, and it's worth remarking again, we observed a deliberate effort in malaria programming to integrate equity, human rights and gender considerations, which is a strong area of progress. My second observation will be around hostile legal environments. We use the term hostile legal environments to capture everything from new conflict, increased uh, or new enforcement of laws, criminalizing key populations, in particular LGBTQ populations, stigma, barriers to registration, and broadly harmful norms. Um, and we saw these in an increasing number of countries, and this is really concerning to the EHRG group because it risks the fragile gains made in progress against HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, in the context of these hostile environments, the TRP drew on the community annex in a few cases, a new tool introduced in GC7 to provide context on community engagement and found it to be a useful supplement to the broader context and all the other documents we get in, in a funding package. We also no noted in countries where there was a hostile environment, but there was also an established legal response mechanism or a crisis response mechanism. These were really critical to mitigating the impact of stigma and hostile environments and making sure there was a response. Uh, to limit the impact on public rights. The third observation, uh, a lot of countries in window two indicated that gender-based violence was a key gender-related barrier to services. Um, and stronger linkages to GBV services continue to be proposed, but not sufficiently budgeted for in allocation. And while, while the EHRG expert group was happy to have the new WHO key POPs guidelines, which have a violence section, there's a UNAIDS normative guidance around conflict, maybe dating back 20, 22 years, 
we really kind of struggled to piece together the normative guidance that would cover this complex intersection of disease, GBV, and particularly in the circumstances of conflict. Fourth observation, many, many countries showed a strategic focus on key populations, which we really welcomed. And yet seeing true intersectionality and in approaches amongst key and vulnerable populations was still lacking. So for example, there's no way we're gonna be able to reach young men, young trans and gender diverse groups, women who use drugs, male sex workers with the standard, standard interventions designed to reach key populations. We need these interventions to be more differentiated. On the bright side, we saw many TB programs strengthening access to services for people deprived of liberty, people in prisons, that was fantastic. Fifth observation, there are several countries with momentum around updating and harmonizing their community health worker programs. Um, this is a real opportunity to make sure as these things happen, as these updates are happening, we're integrating equity, human rights, and gender considerations. As Robin said, equitable compensation is really important, a better gender balance amongst CHW cadres to ensure that women are reaching women, um, and empowerment for community health workers who are key populations. It's really important, particularly in the context of this strategy, that community health workers includes community-led health workers. Um, budget allocations for human rights and gender. We did, a, we did a quick sample across all the window to funding requests and noted that 28 of the countries allocated to zero to 1% of their, of their allocation budget to removing gender and human rights related barriers. Um, and while this is positioned in the context of more recognition and more narrative focus, I think it's really inadequate if we, if we want these programs to reach their full potential and to make sure they're catalyzing access to services for HIV, TB and malaria. We're really pleased to see a correlation between countries participating in the Breaking Down Barriers Program and Matching Fund. Uh, they, saw, they tended to include a higher quality intervention, more technically sound interventions on human rights and gender. And in some cases, this was uh, also accompanied by a higher allocation from the budget. Next slide, please. So our six recommendations. Overall technical partners and secretariat should continue supporting countries with these critical assessments. Um, make sure that the assessments are not only conducted, but built into plans to program and to budget. Um, applicants should ensure the findings of the assessment really inform the development of their funding requests and budget. Second recommendation, in the context of hostile legal environments, this comes back to a point Robin just meant, made, I think it's really critical that the technical partners and secretariat should support advocacy to mitigate the impact of hostile environments and where relevant, this would be the use of the Global Fund Diplomatic Voice as well. The secretariat should consider emergency funding for civil society and community-led advocacy in these hostile environments, knowing that in some circumstances, even participation in the CCM processes might not be possible. Kind of related to this, uh, the Equity, Human Rights and Gender Group would encourage the Secretariat to continue to strengthen the community annex tool and processes. We understand it's a new tool um, and consider its inclusion in funding request packages. It's really useful kind of complement to the, uh, the information the TRP receives. Applicants should invest in community-led monitoring to ensure a quick response to rights violations in rapidly changing contexts. The third recommendation, partners should support applicants to support strengthen GBV linkages. This is at policy level and financing and service provision at country level and actively explore the development of new normative guidance at this intersection. Fourth recommendation, applicants should ensure tailored interventions to address uh, the intersectionality between key populations to ensure maximum impact from programs. Secretariat and technical partners need to foster further support for intersectional programming and budgeting, really just pointing out and noting the differences required when making these plans. Fifth, community health workers, applicants should undertake and or utilizing, utilize the existing equity, human rights and gender assessments and analysis that we, that we see is on, on underway to inform updates to community health worker programs. And finally, back to this point on budget allocation, we really encourage the secretary to support applicants to adequate, al allocate adequate budget for removing human rights and gender related barriers and invest in structures and systems which, which support larger budget allocations to this critical area of work. Um, the Breaking Down Barriers Strategic Initiative seems to be producing really strong results. Um, so this and the matching funds should be further scaled up. Thank you so much. I'm happy to hand over to our malaria focal point, Tom.
Thanks, Naomi. Um, yeah, happy to be here today. Report back on the lessons learned uh, from window two for malaria. Um, so we noted six key observations that we saw across funding requests in window two. Um, the first, as Javi mentioned, uh, is funding gaps. So countries continue to face significant uh, challenges in funding core treatment and prevention interventions. Uh, there just simply isn't enough uh, uh, funding in the allocations uh, to cover core interventions. But on a positive note, um, with data use, we observed uh, better use of country data for uh, prioritizing and targeting of interventions. Um, we noted this across countries in window two, funding requ requests in window two. And then one country uh, in particular, we, we note, uh, we, we commend them for conducting a very detailed subnational analysis of the epidemiological trends in both malaria and uh, intervention coverage. And then this was used as a um, evidence base for the entire funding request. Uh, it was really well done. And, and that's just one country among many. Um, second, uh, thirdly, we note uh, allocation misalignment. Um, so we observed large increases in the malaria burden in some countries. And primarily we're talking about uh, increases uh, due to man-made and natural disasters. Uh, and we know that this will take time to overcome uh, this, this surge in malaria burden. Um, however, country allocation amounts uh, did not appear to account for uh, these situations. Next, pre-referral of countries, including pre-referral rectal testinate suppositories, uh, but some funding requests did not demonstrate a strong referral system for severe malaria across the cascade of, of, of care. Uh, as per WHO recommendations. For IRS, um, so we observed high burden countries on their own with large gaps in vector control shifting from IRS to effective next generation ITNs to cover more of their high risk populations. However, some, some high burden countries continue to use IRS uh, over next generation ITNs even when they had these really large gaps in vector control that were put into the PAR. Um. And lastly, for elimination, we observed uh, in elimination settings, uh, inadequate, timely uh, foci response within the implementation of their case-based surveillance uh, system and implementation, um, which is not aligned with WHO uh, elimination guidelines. And next on to recommendations. Next slide, please. So we have three recommendations for uh, applicants, and then two for uh, the technical partners and the secretariat. First, with respect to rectal testinate suppositories, uh, we recommend, recommend countries follow the latest WHO uh, information for management of severe malaria, including uh, striving to establish and support strong referral systems uh, for severe malaria across the continuum of care, especially in remote settings where pre-referral rectal testinate suppositories uh, are proposed and are being used. So of note here is, is that we really recommend uh, that this be clearly articulated in the funding request. So whether it's domestic uh, finances, uh, non-global uh, fund uh, uh, finances or global fund investments, uh, we just, it, it, it's nice to, it, we, it's, it needs to be clearly articulated in the funding request. So in resource con constrained settings in high burden countries where large gaps exist for vector control, as we've noted, uh, countries may consider uh, switching from IRS to effective next generation ITNs with a focus on maximizing coverage and use among the most at risk populations in the highest transmission settings. Uh, we also recommend applicants include a strong justification in their funding request uh, if they're going to continue to use uh, IRS on a wide scale within these contexts. So we also uh, recommend that applicants work with their technical partners uh, to focus on building sufficient capacity and human resources to uh, fully implement a uh, complete foci response uh, within countries that are uh, in the elimination phase. And this is following WHO recommendations. So to the technical partners and secretariat uh, on allocation methodology, uh, we recommend the secretariat and partners review the uh, allocation methodology uh, really to try and include more recent factors, uh, especially with respect to uh, human and man-made uh, natural disasters um, uh, to, to, to take a look at how these trends in, in malaria 
have changed and how long it's going to take to overcome them. And then lastly, um, uh, we recommend uh, that the Secretariat consider coordinating uh, coordinated regional funding approaches to help address the increasing uh, malaria burden as a result of these man-made and natural disasters. Uh, and this should include accounting for population movement across borders. And with that, I'll pass it over to uh, my colleague, Ernest, to go through HIV. Thank you, Tom. Uh, for HIV, I think we had a couple of lessons. The first one was, as TRP, we saw inconsistent information on distribution of HIV by population and geography. So applicants were presenting information, but it was not sufficiently tailored in terms of distribution of HIV by population. And in particular, the epidemiology and the surveys were not current or inclusive of all populations, leading to inaccurate size estimates. We also noted that many countries, cascades, were not sufficiently disaggregated to cover all relevant populations, including doing finer age disaggregations. We also noted a significant lack of prevention cascades to help guide prevention interventions. Applic applicants did include comorbidities in the application, and this is commended. However, we did not find data to back why they have selected these comorbidities for funding. As a recommendation to applicants, we request that surveys that are being done and population size estimates should be updated and current and cover all populations, and that the data that is developed from these surveys is used to guide program implementation. We also request as TRP applicants to properly analyze the distribution of HIV by population and geography, looking particularly at the burden of disease and the coverage of the interventions. We also noted some instances where data was missing from the pre-field essential data tables. We kindly request applicants to provide this missing information. To partners, we request them to support applicants to do better cascade analysis and in particular, the HIV prevention cascades, and that these cascades are sufficiently disaggregated by the various categories, including by age. Next slide. The second is the poor performance on pediatric and adolescent HIV management. As TRP, we were significantly concerned by the first insufficient understanding and progress on why the pediatric and adolescent cascades in many applications was performing poorly. Particularly, applicants did not use final age disaggregation, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, or 10 to 15, to better tailor any proposed interventions if they were actually included in the application. Many don't even have these interventions at all. When it came to adolescents, we noted that HIV interventions were provided as standard packages without adequately differentiating based on the complexities of treatment and adherence in this population. Our recommendation to applicants is we need an urgent and immediate focus on children and adolescents who are being left behind. In HIV, the full continuum of care should be strengthened and firmly linked to PMTCT and family health services, including maternal and child health. We, as TRP, request applicants to quickly adopt the normative guidance on pediatric treatment, and in particular, the dosage recommendations on dolitegravir that are coming up in the forthcoming guidelines. The partners and secretariat of TRP we recommend them to work with applicants to address the worrying gap in the pediatric and adolescent cascades, and also to accelerate the uptake of normative WHO guidance. Next slide. The third lesson was denoted exclusion of some key populations in HIV interventions. As mentioned earlier, we noted some, that some populations were left out in surveys and even further from differentiated survey delivery being funded by many allocation. And in particular, as mentioned earlier, in countries with repressive legal environments. Now, what we recommend as TRP applicants is based on epidemiology and context and vulnerability to ensure the inclusion of interventions and budgeting for all relevant key populations in line with WHO normative guidance. We as TRP also propose the enhanced inclusion of all key and vulnerable communities 
in HIV service delivery, service design of services evaluation so that we can properly address the unique needs. The fourth lesson, next slide, is a challenge around treatment optimization. As TRP, we noted variations in how regimens were being used for second line treatment. I want to particularly point out the slow progress on the introduction of dolutegravir as a second line treatment, as it is a cheaper option than the protease inhibitor based regimens. We also noted lack of progress in the treatment of some opportunistic infections, in particular cryptococcal meningitis. We recommend to applicants the adoption of guidelines aligned to WHO, especially for the use of DTG, a second line, because this has a cost benefit. These recommendations linked to recommendation to partners to support applicants to accelerate uptake of normative guidance with urgency, because there is a cost benefit in adopting DTG. This will unlock funds uh, to go into the, to the register of unfunded quality demand. The last lesson is on, next slide. Challenges in sufficient differentiation and adoption of HIV interventions. So we still continue to see a lack of differentiation for adolescent girls and young women. We know there are different age groups, different HIV risk profiles, different geographies, different profiles, but we still saw standardized interventions being proposed for this important population. We also did not see enough details being provided where applicants were undertaking differentiated service delivery models like multi-month dispensing. As noted earlier in the lessons learned, interventions like PrEP and HIV self-testing were proposed, but the details on how they would be adapted based again on EPI and context and populations was missing. So we ask applicants to adopt normative guidance and for HYW in particular, to have a closer look at the global HIV prevention condition guidance to help them improve their targeted intervention for adolescents. We want more details and funding requests on how DSD models are being provided based on population and geography and not just provided as a standard package. Finally, we ask applicants to adapt service delivery for interventions and consider such factors as HIV risk, vulnerability to HIV risk, vulnerability, accessibility, and importantly, the consideration of user preferences. And finally, on PrEP, we want much closer adherence to normative guidance to ensure this important prevention tool is targeted adequately. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Rita to take you through the TB lessons. Thank you very much, Ernest. It's my pleasure to present the two key TB lessons. TRP noted that the detection of drug susceptible and drug resistant TB continue to still lag behind. And we would like to echo the observations from window one earlier this year. We noted with pleasure that all funding requests where TB was included had modules and interventions to expand detection. And there was also demonstration of more action on the following key points. Though we feel that we need to keep the following population groups further on the agenda. They include children, adolescents, and men with TB who experience perhaps the greatest detection gaps regarding TB detection. It's also important for us to enhance TB detection in advanced HIV disease. And more widely, we would need to keep uh, strengthening services to reduce the TB burden among people living with HIV. That is uh, intensified TB case finding in HIV care, scale up of TB preventative treatment among people living with HIV. TRP further observed that there is need to ensure strong TB detection in health facilities, as many funding requests seem to cover community level activities in more detail and with more, with more interventions that went uh, from strength to strength. TRP wishes that we continue to aim towards nationwide case funding uh, strategies and approaches and ensure their quality implementation. 
We also need to support of um, various uh, other activities to enhance uh, TB case detection. They include the support of community TB or community health activities, laboratory services, commodity supply, and at all times, linkage to treatment initiation and people-centered care needs to be considered. Many funding requests do cover uh, populations living in urban slums, though not often or not always at a scale. However, TRP noticed that remote and often rural areas uh, consisted of hard to reach populations that were not well uh, covered. Further, TRP noted that we need to continue with careful monitoring of progress so that we ensure that the targets that have been set are also met. The bottom part of this slide summarizes some uh, recommendations, firstly for the applicants. TRP wishes them to strengthen the introduction and implementation of all recommendations of the revised normative guidance on child and adolescent TB and invite technical support when necessary. We say this because we noted that most applicants have focused on introduction of the shorter four months uh, TB treatment regimen for children with drug susceptible and uh, non-severe TB. However, the normative guidance includes several other recommendations that include systematic use of various non-respiratory specimens, particularly stool specimens in children um, for uh, WHO recommended rapid diagnostic testing. Regarding people, including children and adolescents living with HIV, we need to enhance the rapid and urgent expansion of urine, the use of urine specimens for TB lab. It's also important for applicants to continue targeting interventions to the right geographies and right populations to optimize yield of TB case finding activities. Applicants should also consider access related barriers to case finding. There are a wide range of barriers. They range from stigma and discrimination to the distance from home to the nearest health facility, use of ease, transport costs, et cetera. And we need to monitor and evaluate the impact of our uh, interventions. And here I would like to refer you to the window of lessons learned where we talk quite a lot about this point, including continued and better use of cascade analysis so that we can continue to observe what happens and whether we truly improve the continuum of care or the transition or linkage from diagnosis and detection to initiation of TB treatment. For partners, we really wish them to engage with the UNICEF agenda for action on childhood TB. TB lesson number two on the next slide um, focuses on the continued need for quality improvement in TB care for better treatment, uh, TB treatment outcomes. Indeed, many funding requests recognize this need and TB, TRP noted this with satisfaction. And we saw a lot of recognition of the need to reduce deaths, uh, loss to follow, as well as persons started on TB treatment who did not have an evaluated outcome. This is important across the entire scope of people with TB, but it's particularly important among people with drug-resistant TB and people living with HIV and TB. And also among certain age groups, and here we would like to highlight the sometimes less favorable treatment outcomes among adolescents with TB. We also noted a limited amount of information about management, perhaps recognition and management of adverse drug effects, especially among people with DRTB who are on second line TB drugs. We would like to put forward the following recommendations applicants. Please continue to expand the access to
as diligently as possible. Applicants also need to ensure that person-centered care and adherence support continues to be provided. Consider using digital adherence technologies if they are applicable and relevant in your context. And also recognize the need for youth-friendly services for adolescents with TB. And not only for adolescents with perhaps reproductive health issues. We also recommend that applicants actively look for root causes for undesirable TB treatment outcomes. If these are not yet known in your I'm context. Sorry. You will need to repeat the slide. At some point, we lost the sound of this. Of, of, I'm sorry for that. But maybe to begin from the beginning of okay. this slide. Thank you. Should I start now? Yes, go ahead, please. Apologies for the technical hitch um, regarding TB lesson two. I'm being asked to start from the beginning. And I note the continued need for quality improvement in TB care for better TB treatment outcomes. The TRP noted that many funding requests recognize this continued need, particularly among people living with DRTB and people having both HIV infection and TB, among whom death, loss to follow up, and perhaps the outcome of not evaluated are more common than among people with drug susceptible TB. There's also an age group of persons with TB whose outcomes may lag behind, and they are the adolescents with tuberculosis. The TRP noted also a limited amount of information about management of adverse drug effects, especially among people who have drug resistant TB and who are taking second line TB medicines. TRP would like to propose the following recommendations, firstly to the applicants. Expand the access to shortened TB treatment regimens, especially the drug resistant TB regimens, and always ensure use of child-friendly preparations for children in your care. It's also necessary to carefully um, monitor and manage drug safety related issues. Ensure that person-centered care and adherence support are provided. You may wish to consider use of digital adherence technologies if they are relevant and feasible in your context. Also recognize the need for youth-friendly services for adolescents with TB, not only youth-friendly services for adolescents with reproductive health issues. It's also very good to understand the root causes for undesirable TB treatment outcomes if these aren't known yet, and develop approach, approaches that particularly address the key root causes. And very often the root causes seem to surround stigma and discrimination, the cost of uh, accessing TB care, particularly pertaining to transport. And they also pertain very often in our settings to the need uh, of nutritional support. The TRP challenges the applicants to expand meaningful uh, interventions that address these common root causes. For the partners, we would like to sum up the two following recommendations. Please do support applicants in their efforts to maximize TB cure and TB treatment completion to prevent development of drug resistance and support cascade analysis so that we can ensure good quality case holding. Over to you, Jerry, regarding ESSH. Thank you, Rita. So I will present uh, four lessons for RSSH. Uh, the first one is on limited progress on health sector reforms to promote integrated people-centered quality health services. We have five observations on this. Firstly, we observe that the RSSH indicators in the performance framework were still inadequate to measure progress, uh, specifically that um, the RSSH assessments were limited to quali qualitative data, making their context difficult to assess. This was especially noted in the COE um, countries. Governance issues were often 
and are addressed in efforts, especially in the disease programs. Uh, we noticed that um, most of the these national disease programs had a lot of governance challenges and these were not adequately addressed uh, and support was mostly for planning and meetings. Thirdly, there were missed opportunities for countries to integrate the various RSSH related applicant guidance materials into program design and for them to learn from their peers. Thirdly, we saw limited information in the efforts to show that the evidence-based policy making was based on systemic evidence or that health systems reforms were addressed. The TRP identified a need for greater attention to, to value for money and efficiencies in the prioritization of interventions. So our recommendations to applicants are, um, applicants need to prioritize addressing governance issues. They should make use of the normative guidance and support from their technical partners and track actions with accountable and effective outcomes. For example, uh, while addressing um, personnel gaps and quality of care amongst other things. Secondly, um, we recommend that the applicants should use the key annexes provided uh, by the TRP. For example, the RSSH gaps and priorities annex, we noted very limited use of this and we really encourage applicants to use this to guide their, their, their interventions. Uh, use of the funding landscape table and programmatic gap tables as tools to assess system-wide gaps. Uh, we recommend that they use these to look at both programmatic and financial uh, gaps uh, to inform and prioritize their interventions. We believe that this will, inform, will improve their value for money um, for their interventions. Applicants are encouraged to refer to case studies from good practices for RSSH interventions. We notice quite a number and uh, we really um, encourage applicants to look at these and also to use simple resources which summarize operational guidelines such as the one pager on value for money. We also have recommendations to the secret partners and the secretariat. Uh, we recommend that the secretariat should develop more indicators and qualitative assessments of RSSH, including on critical program approaches. These could be included in the funding request narrative, performance frameworks, and essential data tables for the funding cycle. Funding requests should also include work plan tracking measures for RSSH investments. Uh, lastly, a partner should support countries in reforming health systems governance, strengthening their ability to capitalize on experience and learning, and basing policy making on this evidence. Next slide. Thank you. Um, the second uh, lesson was uh, we noted um, very encouraging signs on inclusion of the health financing module in the funding request. But we also noted incomplete information on co-financing, funding landscape, and social health insurance. So our observations were, uh, like mentioned, we saw incomplete information on the financial contributions and funding landscape of applicants. We also noted that national public financial management systems are often underperforming, reducing the opportunities for use of domestic systems by donors. Thirdly, uh, we were very encouraged to note that um, some countries introduced a health financing module in their funding requests. Um, unfortunately, these were often weak and unambitious. Uh, the targets, the, the interventions were very limited and we'd, uh, we'd be very happy to see more, more detailed um, interventions. Um, many countries adopted the primary healthcare or universal uh, health coverage objectives, but health information Health insurance uh, implementation was found to be lagging in many. Uh, we often saw that there were difficulties in integrating HIV, TB, and malaria into the benefit, into the benefit packages. However, we did, we did note a few good examples uh, which would form a basis for case studies. The TRP saw um, inconsistent level of quality and degree of information in funding landscape tables and RSSH gaps and priorities annex, making it difficult to assess. Uh, for potential duplication of efforts and progress in domestic financing and co-financing. The TRP saw progress from applicants in a couple of transition portfolios in how they detailed key elements of sustainability. For example, in financial, uh, in the financial part, we saw increased domestic financing. We saw support to programs, transition and sustainability plans were also quite detailed. However, we also noted that operational plans were still missing on investments in areas such as HRH, human resources health, human resources for health, and health products. 
Our key recommendation to applicants is that um, they should strengthen their public financial management systems to monitor health expenditures, including those for HIV, TB, and malaria. Our recommendations to partners and their secretariats, we recommend that um, secretariats should support countries to gather and prepare a more complete financial landscape with visibility on how global fund spending sits alongside other external and domestic spending in a country. This should include RSSH investments in all building blocks. Partners and secretariats need to support applicants with integrating HIV, TB, malaria into PHC and primary healthcare and universal healthcare coverage packages. The secretariat is also recommended to provide the TRP with improved information on realization of co-financing commitments and domestic financing for disease programs. This is so that uh, the TRP can be able to make uh, informed decision and help leverage and orient for financing towards impactful interventions. Lastly, our recommendation to both partners and secretariat, um, they should support focus and transition portfolio countries with developing detailed analysis on key elements of sustainability with detailed operational plans on sustainability and transition that include the broader health systems and not just key populations and civil society. Next slide. Our third lesson is that um, we noted um, very encouraging um, progress towards early stages integration into primary healthcare, uh, but we still feel that there's a long, long way still to go. Uh, this is uh, outlined in the various observations that uh, we'll talk about. Firstly, we saw evidence of early stage integration into PHC in some countries, uh, but we noted that most funding requests provided limited details on how they are integrating disease-specific service delivery into primary health care. We noted uh, a very encouraging shift uh, towards integration of community healthcare workers, but in terms of their interventions, in terms of a CHW um, uh, having broad interventions and not just one disease-specific interventions. However, we noticed um, several missed opportunities to address community system strengthening in a holistic approach. For example, uh, we noted that uh, civil society capacity building was not, uh, was not uh, very well integrated, community-led monitoring, community engagement and coordination, and leadership building. Our third observation in the, on this is that many countries face important challenges uh, related to human resources for health, uh, such as shortages, uh, quality of human resources, donor dependency for in-service training and supervision. Um, and we noted that um, we, we noted very limited examples of how global fund or partners are supporting the strengthening of HRH in a comprehensive and sustainable way. So for this lesson, our recommendations are to partners and the secretariat. Uh, we recommend that secretariat supports a continued focus of applicants on integrating disease specific interventions into primary health care. We also recommend that um, missed opportunities are addressed to, set, to, to strengthen all elements of community system strengthening, for example, especially community led monitoring. We also recommend that uh, there should be a focus on linking programs with health systems as complementary uh, interventions and not as replacements to uh, health systems. Uh, lastly, we recommend, we recommend that uh, applicants should be supported in developing comprehensive plans for human resources for health, including conducting labor market analysis and developing a human resource management system, information systems to inform future HRH reforms towards programmatic impact and sustainability. Last slide, please. The final lesson is that uh, we, we noted um, some progress on health, human, on health management information systems, laboratory management information systems, and also hum, um, health products management systems. However, we noted that uh, several critical challenges still remain. So uh, our observations, uh, we were very happy to note that uh, applicants use data to plan interventions, especially with integrated health management information systems. Uh, and this was really driven by the COVID-19 response mechanism, uh, but we noted that uh, there were still gap, uh, gaps in data quality. We noted limited progress on integration and interoperability of data management information systems. Uh, these are the HMIS 
the LMIS and uh, HRIS, Human Resource Information Management System. Um, we saw an increased focus. We happily saw and we're very happy that um, there was an increased focus and investment on supply chain management, uh, for example, especially those that are supported by C19 RM. However, we noted that several challenges still persist as far as um, tech products management is concerned, uh, specifically on procurement, regulatory regula regulations, capacity building, strong management, uh, stock management, warehousing capacity, information systems, and transportation, especially last mile delivery. Uh, we noted that the supply chain strategic plans were, varying, were of varying quality or absent. We also uh, noted that there was evidence of increased investments in lab systems, uh, for example, in uh, transport, quality assurance, HR, and logistics. We noted, um, uh, especially for this module, that uh, these were largely complementary to investments supported by C19RM. Uh, and some of the FRs showed limited evidence of having informed, been informed by gaps, analysis, or detailed strategic plans. Uh, most of our recommendations are to our partners and the secretariat. Uh, we recommend that um, the partners and secretariat provide enhanced support to countries on using data information program decisions. We recommend that uh, Africans should be supported to accelerate the data integration process for their information management systems, including HMIS, LMIS, HRIS, and HPMS. We also recommend that applicants should be supported on supply chain system strengthening, strengthening and this should include last mile delivery and on using evidence-based prioritization in order to prevent stockouts. Uh, thirdly, we recommend that applicants should be supported in performing laboratory systems gaps and analysis in order to inform strategic plans and build towards effective lab systems which can better support the disease programs. Uh, Fourthly, we recommend that um, applicants should be supported to provide further structured guidance on supply chain management in order to help inform country level supply chain management plans. We, this should include uh, global fund policy guidance on infrastructure investments such as warehousing. Lastly, we recommend that um, secretariat and partners work to identify ways that investments in health system strengthening can benefit from the use of country-led and sustainable pooled procurement mechanisms. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, Jabu. We're not hearing you yet. The room microphone is off. Okay, can you hear me now? I hope so. So just appreciating my TRP colleagues for the presentations. Uh, and to remind again that uh, the slides are going to be shared uh, after the session. The translations may be a little bit uh, delayed, uh, French and Spanish translations. And I'm also reminded that uh, the Global Fund will soon be publishing the funding request narratives on their website, possibly in the next couple of weeks. So where we've made reference to some good examples, you can refer to the uh, funding request narratives. But just on the questions, there are quite a number. Uh, we will try and address as many as we can, bearing in mind that we've got just under 45 minutes uh, remaining. Um, so there was a question, are you going to show the questions? Um, the lessons learned uh, and recommendations from window, uh, from window two, are they going to be shared with the window three applicants? Uh, that uh, I'll leave uh, for the Global Fund, but generally uh, we share the uh, lessons learned, but uh, given that uh, window three is imminent, we don't know to what extent uh, you know, uh, applicants will be able to incorporate. So we encourage uh, with what we've had so far and as soon as you get the slides for those applicants that are still working on their funding requests to already start incorporating. Uh, can, can I move to the second question? Uh, on uh, new psychoactive substances. Uh, I'll pass that on to my colleague, Naomi, if you want to check that question. Thanks, Jabu. Um, so I can think of, do I need to wait for the, there we go. Um, after consulting with, with TIP colleagues, I think we can think of, of one example where we, uh, we saw some active attempts to ensure that there was procurement of 
drug testing equipment. Um, whether or not it was placed in the budget of the PAR is not entirely clear. It looks like it's in the PAR. And then we saw some other country examples where there was attempts to train people to understand um, the impacts of, uh, of new psychoactive substances as part of a changing drug supply and the need for the HIV response to adapt accordingly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ramirez, do you want to add to that or that's good? Um, maybe just to add that uh, in this cycle, in this grand cycle, uh, the Global Fund guidance has been very explicit on the subject that there is also the emergence of new psychoactive substances. So probably what TMP is observing that these recommendations and uh, highlights from the Global Fund Secretariat of what are the needs are not really so much uptaken by the applicants, unfortunately. And I remember last uh, window we were asked about hepatitis C, which is also a new recommendation from the Global Fund, whether there is uptake of that. And uh, I'm happy to report that at least a couple of countries have uh, included hepatitis C, both diagnostics and treatment uh, in their funding requests. Thank you. Thank you both. The question on uh, uh, CCM capacity building, I think uh, we, we've noted uh, from what we've seen in the pub, in the funding requests, you know, general uh, poor or weak coordination, but we're also mindful that uh, Global Fund is a whole work stream on CCM evolution. Uh, and to the extent that the CCM evolution project is available to uh, share the reports that I would leave to Secretariat, but we really uh, commend and uh, uh, recommend that CCM capacity uh, in most instances, as we see from the funding request, would still require attention, particularly in coordination of various actors and uh, partners in country, particularly in fostering stewardship within the government ministries. I give an example, say, for instance, the new RSSH annex, which I'm quite passionate about, that what we are seeing is when this annex is being completed, it looks like it's still being completed in silos, whereas it would actually be prudent for the relevant uh, departments responsible for planning within ministries of health to actually take the lead and bring all actors together and for the CCM to support and facilitate that stewardship role. So I give that as just one example, but there are many that, that, uh, that can be looked at. And of note also, like I said, to refer applicants uh, uh, in consultation or with, with uh, support from the uh, secretariat to findings of the uh, CCM evolution. Um, then now we may come back to you on uh, examples that we may have seen on uh, community-led uh, organizations, Thanks, registration Jeremy. thereof. I think question four and five are, are somewhat kind of interconnected mm -hmm. in my thinking and the answer as well. Um, in this particular window, we did, we did see a number of funding requests articulate the fact that this was a barrier to community-led and community-based organizations receiving funding. We didn't see any magical like solutions that are outside the box that you wouldn't see under any kind of normal funding flow arrangement or contracting arrangement. I think what kind of taking in five a little bit more, what, what the TIP was encouraging was where there is a social contracting process piloted or designed under a funding request, request or underway, to be really specific about thinking about the barriers that a community led organization versus a community based versus a civil society organization would face in order to participate in the eventual public contracting mechanism. So we, we can think of an example from Eastern Europe in recent years where all the work to set up a, a public contracting system resulted in a system so difficult that community-led and civil society organizations couldn't access the funding still. So we we're very specific about making sure that any recommendations were about designing a system that community-led and community-based organizations could access. In one particular country, um, the TRP made a recommendation for a slight shift in approach um, where we recommended that the civil society networks that were interested in registering had some specific steps um, laid out and got the, the technical support required to ensure they could register, not just for the purpose of social contracting, but for the kind of additional factors of legitimacy and having a formal entity to protect them um, being part of the reason that uh, any community-led organisation would register. Thank you, Naomi. Moving on to com comment six, uh, we, we see that more is a comment, uh, and I really appreciate the colleague who put that forward. Um, the, again, this speaks to the CCM uh, question that we spoke about and broadly speaks to, to coordination and partnerships. We know that uh, partnerships is one of the uh, global fund uh, key shifts, uh, and we also noted uh, in our window one recommendations that given the challenges countries are going to face uh, with GC7, 
grant implementation, given the limited fiscal space issues around coordination that we've spoken about. There is a, uh, if ever there was a time for greater coordination, alignment of donors with national priorities, again, going back to uh, what my colleague Robin always reminds us, you know, principles of aid effectiveness, it's really time to, to, to do this now in uh, uh, ensuring effective implementation of, uh, of uh, GC7 grants. So again, this goes to, to, to what we've uh, really uh, highlighted on the role of the uh, ministries of health, the role of a uh, uh, CCM to coordinate uh, different uh, government departments. And I must also call out uh, the participation and role of the Minister of Finance that's coming through as we look at uh, uh, challenges most countries are facing in, uh, in, uh, in sustainability. So we check that more, more as a comment, but totally agree with that, uh, that comment the colleague put on chat. On uh, disaster preparedness and resilience, resilience uh, you know, our lens to this has been largely, uh, from a PP perspective, the uh, complementarity between C19RM and uh, GC7 applications. And I must uh, really appreciate and commend the country teams for the uh, SBN, uh, the Secretariat Briefing Note, which we are seeing across all funding requests, is really giving us a very good uh, insight into what countries are, uh, are currently uh, implementing in their existing uh, uh, C19RM grants, what's uh, being proposed in uh, GC7 uh, funding requests, and what's likely to come in uh, portfolio optimization wave two of uh, C19RM. So that visibility has been very useful for TRP to then check for complementarities, for duplication where they, where they might be. We've seen, I think, specific to your question around uh, you know, integration across HTM, we have seen evidence that there is a uh, uh, building on of investments made through C19RM, particularly say in uh, lab optimization, we are seeing evidence of that. But I may also just ask my colleagues uh, in HIV, TB and malaria if they wanted to, to further speak to that. And also maybe uh, Tom uh, could speak to the uh, issues around what we are seeing in terms of climate change challenges. I think this came up uh, with one of the uh, applications that we looked at where we are beginning to see possibly an upsurge of malaria cases, but it could be you know, argued whether that's really due to climate change. And then uh, uh, my colleague Jerry or Dipanjan can speak to the uh, uh, electronic medical record system and any links that we are seeing there with uh, uh, investments in PPP. So maybe starting off with uh, uh, Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree. Um, we, we can increase pandemic preparedness across the, the three diseases. Um, and when we, you know, experience these types of challenges, uh, um, you know, as a result potentially of climate change. Um, uh, so, you know, as we mentioned in, in our lessons learned that I can speak for malaria that um, we recommended that the uh, secretary and technical partners uh, consider uh, cross-border uh, initiatives that um, uh, address uh, these types of disasters. Even if it's in one, one country, oftentimes spills over into another. Thanks. <clears throat> And uh, TB colleagues, uh, uh, do you want to speak a bit to the integration with C19 RM investments, for instance, with the uh, TB? Do I have Rita? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. Yes, indeed, I think we are starting to see more and more uh, uh, synergies between both TB as well as C19 RM responses, which is very, very rewarding. And I think the applicants deserve to be uh, commended in this regard. But still more can and should be done. Thank you. Over to you, Ernest. Any observations from HIV side? Yeah, I think the key one is uh, the multiplexing of platforms and the coordination between the laboratory equipment. Uh, and there's complementarities in terms of expanding access to diagnostic networks as well.
Okay. So I, 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 we can share a lot more on that, but uh, this just gives uh, illustratively where we are seeing those synergies between C19 RM investments and uh, the core grants. Uh, Naomi, I come back to you. There's quite a bunch of uh, questions there on uh, uh, community health workers, uh, budgets, uh, allocation for EHRG interventions, which is more of a comment. Do you want to just uh, look Thank at you. those? Uh... Thanks, Tabu. Yeah. yeah. No. Thank you. Um, so in relation to eight, thank you for your observation, five on community health workers. <clears throat> Great. Um, the budget observation on the allocation for EHRG interventions is sobering. Yes, it is. It's really great that we have this data available to us. I think the equity, human rights and gender experts don't expect all gender or human rights or equity interventions to be solely in that module. Um, but it is an indicator that's really useful for us and we can use that going forward. The observation on better linkages and ways of working between peers delivering health services, particularly relevant for intersectionality. I think that might be more of a comment than a question. I agree, it's really exciting to see this much attention and focus on community health workers. We just need to make sure that those community health workers, the cadres always include community led key population, people with lived experience. Can I turn to um, another expert on the NCDs and mental health question? Yeah. H. Ernest. Let's speak to the NCDs. 11. Question. Question 11. Yeah, we noted um, we noted in the countries that are integrating primary health care that there was mention of addressing um, comorbidities and mental health, most especially in um, the CHW integrated um, approach at the community level and referring them to the health facilities, especially the primary health care facilities. That's, that's probably the example we can speak to, but Ernest has more to say. Yeah, I have two good examples. One was uh, one funny request that gave a very good background analysis of mental health concerns in the country. Some studies done amongst people with HIVs, then proposed interventions for mental health being integrated into, into the intervention. Another application also had a good assessment of deaths amongst people living with HIV, but indicated that the majority of them were from HIV related causes and proposed interventions for you know, cardiovascular treatments, including hypertension and heart disease. Uh, in those. So we are increasingly seeing better uh, inclusion, but as mentioned earlier in the recommendations, they still need to have data that, that provides the justification for NCDs. But we are seeing some really good examples on, on addressing comorbidities and uh, applications. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Ernest. You. And if we look at this question, Chabu, may I continue? Just briefly yes, go through the TB lens. Yes. Thank you. Through the TB lens. We can uh, definitely confirm the continued strong attention on TB HIV connection or association. Um, what is perhaps new and what we are seeing increasingly is consideration of diabetes as a TB comorbidity, as well as mental health, as Ernest has already mentioned. Where we didn't see any funding requests really uh, addressing uh, other common comorbidities that pertain to smoking, alcohol use, and very importantly, undernutrition. So those ones remain largely absent, at least in this window too. Thank you. Right. Jabu, can I come in? Uh, yes, please uh, go ahead, uh, Anjan, maybe briefly, yeah. then we go to the next batch of questions. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the question on the, to address the comorbidities and mental health. We did see a couple of examples, and especially COE countries, where mental health is a major issue. So the community uh, health workers have been you know, tasked, and there is the primary health care is being uh, strengthened out there to support this. So we do have some examples. Thank you very much. So uh, Naomi, do you want to check 12 is more of a comment, but maybe more specifically address 18? Yeah, so with uh, the 12 and 13 in the chat, um, 
the recommendation on hostile environments is legitimate, very tricky. Um, yes, and I think that in every context, the, ex the experts are on the ground, um, not sitting with us here in Geneva. Um, I can think of one good example of a country in which the community-led monitoring and monitoring system was combined. They ma managed everything from, from stockouts of medicines to human rights violations, kind of centering it in, in the health sector, gave them some ability and some strategic advantage. On the recommendations for countries push push or soften legislations implemented. I think the, the recommendation that came out in the slide was um, for the Global Fund Secretariat to really recognize the impact and, and maybe prioritize specific funding um, to respond to these hostile environments. And you know, the example that really rises to mind in, in the first six months of this year is the criminalization of LGBT rights. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, 14, I'll take as a comment on public contracting, social contracting. The next one will be 15, next slide, yeah. Um, yeah, the question on C19RM, uh, again, I uh, you know, responded to, to this, that uh, we, we are seeing greater visibility within TRP and thanks to the country teams for the uh, secretary briefing note, but more importantly, going into window three, uh, like I say, TRP is now already uh, uh, reviewing C19RM funding requests. So that will give us you know, even uh, more visibility to see where there are duplications and where there are synergies. Uh, but one area that really stood out is uh, C19 investments in, uh, in laboratory strengthening. That, that really stood out as, a, as an area where we are seeing synergy and, uh, and, and progress, but it's probably too early at this stage to, to, to tell to what extent that, uh, that, that synergy is, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is leveraged on. Um, so I think that's something uh, certainly to look out for in our uh, next uh, review window. Uh, community health worker programs, I think that, that's also been, uh, been addressed. We've spoken much about that. If you look at uh, TRP uh, uh, window one observations, we, we say quite a bit, they totally agree that where we are seeing uh, need for more progress is absorption of community health worker uh, remuneration into, uh, into uh, uh, national budgets, but even so also issues around uh, uh, to what extent community health workers are adequately uh, uh, compensated. So those are areas that, that continue and remain needing to be addressed. Next slide. Uh, Robin, do you want to take uh, question 17 on uh, social contracting? I, again, this, this has come up quite a bit. Uh, you may want to just say a few words about that. Yeah, and just um, to preempt one of the, the next questions, we are using the term public contracting, but we respect that it is often described as social NGO contracting. Um, but we feel that public contracting is a more precise terminology and Raminta can say more on this if you wish. Um, in terms of the uh, what's called a, a rather vague recommendation, I think the point is that it is context specific. So in a number of countries, uh, TRP has made the recommendation to look at legislation. Sometimes it's about adjusting legislation, sometimes it's about bringing in, in legislation, sometimes it's about using the legislation that exists and it will depend country by country. We also recognize that there is a, a range of different community health worker um, uh, programs just relating to the previous slide and so uh, question. And so in many cases, the recommendation will be about integrating in national budgets, but in some cases, it may be about public contracting because those services are provided uh, through civil society organizations. And therefore we didn't want to be um, uh, directive in, in our recommendation to presume that all countries and contexts are the same. And of course we do agree with the importance of best practices, but it is important that those best practices are um, just showing examples where public contracting is enabling all forms of community-led, community-based and civil society organizations to access sustainable resources. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I, I, I appreciate that number 18 is more of a comment, but I think uh, it's, it's, it's probably important for our TB and HIV colleagues to speak to this, because in this window, we particularly observed increasing gaps uh, in uh, children, uh, adolescents, and also young people, both in TB programs and also in, uh, in HIV programs. Ernest, you may want to speak to this, and I'll also ask uh, Rita, to speak to the uh, concerns that we observed about pediatric TB. Uh, thanks, Jabba. I think the challenge when we to pediatric is this acceptance that although the cascades are performing poorly, we're not seeing any urgency. You know, because 
Cold rubber for children has been difficult from the beginning. But I think the challenge we're seeing now, people are quickly moving on to some of the new interventions and not actually identifying that the pediatric programs are not doing well. We're also noticing that a lot of these challenges come from poorly functional PMPCT programs. So the basics for PMPCT in terms of ensuring diagnosis, retaining mother-baby pairs is slowly being lost, particularly in West Africa. As Ramita mentioned, in about uh, almost 10 of the applications we saw from West Africa, PMPCT programs are not doing well. Mother-baby pairs are not being retained. In consequence, we're getting HIV-infected children who are not getting into programs. We're not seeing enough linkages to child health services. And applicants are simply not addressing this. Uh, you know, they are moving on to other interventions. So we want a renewed and urgent focus on PMTCT and pediatric uh, treatment. Thank you, Jabu. Rita, do you want to speak to pediatric TB gaps in? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jabu, and thank you, Ernest. In those settings where HIV infection is still fueling TB, TB programs obviously are under pressure if the pediatric TB, HIV services are not performing uh, up to our expectations. So there's definitely a strong linkage. So what is good within pediatric HIV AIDS management is also good for child TB. Uh, what we saw in these funding requests is that most of the countries are not yet at the, should I say, expected level of 10 to 15% of all TB cases being notified among, uh, among children and adolescents. And this is TRP's great concern, especially now that we have more tools to detect and bacteriologically confirm presence of TB in children. Um, we also wanted as TRP to um, uh, highlight perhaps the, um, recommendations from the guidelines, normative guidelines from March 2022, that point countries to consider modes of decentralized care, diagnosis, treatment, and care for children with TB. Because if we expect the few pediatricians who may be in our countries working in childhood health conditions in general to diagnose all children with TB, we will not see the success and impact that we really want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Next slide. Uh, I'll stay with you again, Rita, because the next ones are, are TB questions, 19 through uh, 22. Thank you very much um, for the tough questions and very valid questions that are posed uh, over here. I think we could perhaps talk about 19 and 21 together. And I would like to uh, uh, perhaps bring to the attention that uh, right geographies are not necessarily the highest burden geographies. And it's not necessarily so that remote and rural areas would somehow by definition have a lower yield for our case detection. Um, activities. So I, I wish to challenge some of these thoughts put uh, forward by the colleagues who, who have posed the questions and I would like to perhaps engage you in some other forum for better discussion on that. So right geographies, I think uh, what TRP was um, wanted to put, put across is really attention to targeted community-based active case finding um, uh, services or interventions so that we could indeed capture those key and priority populations that may not be reached through, for example, static services. Having said that, we need to keep in mind the balance between too much and too little attention. And here perhaps uh, I was prompted and stimulated to think a little bit further by the person who posed question number 22. This person is wishing me to elaborate a little bit more about active case planning um, activities. So I think generally TRP is satisfied, but we would like to see more quality interventions that capture contact management, contact investigations, because I think in most high TB 
uh, burn-in settings. This is a very rewarding activity, and I don't think that all funding requests uh, did excel in this regard. This activity, contract management, can in enhance TB case detection on one hand, especially among children and adolescents. This was a gap that we recognized earlier, but it can also add to us uh, detection and identification of eligible persons of all ages for TB preventative therapy. Also, TB case finding among uh, people living with HIV and people living with other comorbidities, as we discussed earlier, is the obvious must-do uh, component of active case finding that we should uh, excel in perhaps before we move on to, let's say, community-based, uh, or not necessarily community-based, because all this we do in collaboration with communities, but I'm really talking about active case finding uh, using uh, new innovations such as mobile vans and uh, such things. Um, a point about the remote rural areas. It's very important for us in our countries to uh, understand the context and size of, size of the populations in these areas, as well as the disease burden. And we need to be aware what operational uh, barriers may be there for access to care. I wonder if I have covered, oh yes, question number 20. This was debated at length by the entire team of 16 TB experts, because I think none of us, or perhaps at most one of us, may have seen recognition of post-TB lung disease, which is something that we really wish to support Global Fund keeping, putting and keeping on the agenda. This links again, to some degree also partially on early TB case detection. The later we find people with TB, the more likely it is that they will develop and have post-TB lung disease, even if they have successfully completed their treatment. So this is an area that we almost highlighted as uh, TB lesson number three, but we stopped short of doing that due to the fact that we were that the standing that we had to limit our lessons to two. We will cover it window three. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rita. I might just uh, come back to you on uh, 23. Next page, please. Uh, I know you've addressed issues around uh, TB uh, and comorbidities, but there's also some new elements there in that question, linkages with social protection that may go beyond just TB and human rights to protect TB response. So if you could take uh, part of that question and I'll go to Naomi for the human rights uh, uh, question uh, related to TB response and social protection. Thank you, Jabu. Uh, question number three is again, not very easy. Um, no, we are not doing enough for other vulnerable populations. Uh, you may recall that the TRP expressed concerns, for example, regarding men with TB because in many of our settings and funding requests, we read about prevalence surveys having revealed higher disease, higher TB burden among men, and at the same time reporting larger gaps among men. So such a simple uh, um, population as men in our communities could perhaps have or experience certain barriers, special barriers to health seeking and access to care. There are definitely other vulnerable populations, though I would like to recognize that many, many funding requests uh, covered quite well issues pertaining to TB in migrants, TB among people living, um, in, uh, in, living in incarceration, the TB in mobile populations, etc. So some progress is made in this regard. Over to you now, before expanding gaps on your observations regarding TB services in vulnerable populations, as well as the social protection as a human rights issue. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. Um, so I can't. Nothing comes to mind in terms of progress to mainstream social protection broadly. 
um, in, in the TV sponsor, response in window two. Um, I believe there's something that came up in window one, a recommendation on this. Um, I will I will emphasize what Rita said. We did see uh, an, a small number of funding requests, which were particularly good in ensuring the TB response was inclusive of refugees, internally displaced people and migrant populations, just making sure that that, that group was captured by the proposed interventions. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, moving on to question 24, can I ask my uh, RSSH colleagues to weigh in on this? It, it's, it's something that continues also from, uh, from window one. Uh, Deepanjan and uh, and Jerry. Um, okay, thank you for this question. Um, I think we would encourage the CCM really to and, and uh, other applicants to focus and primary recipients to focus on this uh, because I think if, if there's no direction from the leadership uh, when these uh, proposals are being written in terms of um, looking at the RSSH annexes and trying to to, um, to, to make sure that the FRs address uh, some of these recommendations, then I think um, we'll, we will still continue to see this. So I think um, our recommendation is that applicants, uh, primary recipients, secondary recipients, CCM really focus, make this a priority in terms of um, when the, the, the FR is being written. Thank you. Dipanjan, do you want to weigh in on that? Yes, please. Uh, First of all, thank you for that question. Uh, the RSSH annexes are an excellent uh, tool, which when filled will give you a much better context of what is happening in the country. So the question is uh, very welcome. And uh, adding to what uh, my colleague Jerry has mentioned about CCM and others, I would also request that, you know, the other way which we can is the technical partners. When you are helping the countries to develop the proposals, et cetera, and the secretariat when you are requesting them, if you could kindly come up and you know make it a priority. See, the health systems ultimately is the most important thing when we were looking at any sustainability or continued program aspect. So in that, to give a more informed information to us and to the Secretariat and to the technical partners, RSSH Annex is an excellent tool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If I, if I can just uh, add to this, uh, I think, given the importance of RISSH, the fragmentation that we are seeing across the board, I think there is number one here, a stewardship role. To what extent are the key actors, all the relevant uh, you know, uh, departments and people in the ministries, particularly people in the planning sections of the Ministry of Health, how much stewardship are they taking in ensuring that there's an integrated approach to RISSH investments that is really built on national health sector plans? So I, th I think there is it, that stewardship role and to what extent we are seeing this reflected in our CCMs and really build that capacity beyond just the three diseases. Because we run the risk here of, uh, again, you know, continued focus on RSSH elements specific to the disease programs, which is great in advancing the HIV, TB, malaria outcomes. But I think there is a greater missed opportunity to actually leverage the broader RSSH annex and underpin it uh, on the national health sector plans and place stewardship within the relevant uh, uh, actors in the, in, the, in the Ministry of Health. I think in terms of annexes, we've seen, yes, a proliferation of a number of annexes, tools that applicants have to, to use. Again, that recommendation then comes to technical partners and Global Fund Secretariat as you support uh, uh, fund, funding request development to ensure that uh, applicants are appropriately guided. Um, can I ask my colleague Tom to take the question number 25 on uh, uh, IPT? Tom? It's a, it's a really good one. Um, so I can speak to IPTP for prevention of uh, malaria and pregnancy. Um, you're absolutely correct. We agree, agree um, that uh, it, it should involve the RMNC AH. Uh, in fact, because IPTP is implemented through antenatal care, uh, typically that's who actually uh, uh, implements it within countries, uh, is, is the RMNC AH uh, program within the Ministry of Health. Um, I, I, I can't speak to how well they've coordinated in pre preparing their funding requests, but our assumption is, is that they have gotten input from their partners uh, in, in RMNCAH. Um, so yeah, in that, that's a critical 
uh, linkage there that, that I think malaria learned early on that they weren't very good at implementing IPTP uh, in, in ANC delivery because that wasn't in their space. And so um, even within supply chain, it, I think it's, it falls under RMNCAH. Uh, yeah, or I don't know if, if my TB or HIV colleagues have something to add. I'm seeing Rita say no. Fantastic, no, thanks, Tom. Uh, other colleagues, do you want to add, uh, particularly on the integration there with the RMNCH uh, programs, you know, from that, uh, you know, integrated uh, uh, service delivery approach. Dipanjan, do you want to add or we move to the next question? Okay, um, I think it comes back, number 26 comes back again, Rita, to you, quite popular today. On, uh, WHO recommended rapid molecular diagnostics. Do you want to pick up that question? Thank you. I'll try. Thank you, Jabba. And perhaps Jerry will also step in to, to assist because I think this may be more of a, also a health systems issue, how we uh, utilize the available lab services, particularly pertaining to the rapid molecular diagnostics. So, yes, this comes across in many, many uh, funding requests, and it's clearly an issue that many applicants struggle with. And um, I, I do recognize also that there could be some balancing to be done between procurement within our allocation budgets and power budget, as well as you know how much money, on the other hand, goes to the activities themselves. Uh, what um, um, TRP noticed is that. Um, it's, it's not necessarily about the optimal workload, but we also need to consider what are the determinants for utilization as we expand the access, as we procure more platforms. Very often the platforms are not utilized fully because there are shortages of, for example, cartridges and other commodities and, you know, that laboratory part comes acquired in that regard. There are also issues about maintenance and non-functional modules. So we may have a large number of platforms and so many modules, but the actual number is lower because so many may be awaiting maintenance service. And one very common challenge, practically perhaps in 80 to 90% of the funding requests pertains to sample transportation and issues how the system works. Is it integrated enough? Is it comprehensive? How functional it is? And I would really challenge the applicants to provide more data in this regard. What are the indicators that you are watching to ensure that the samples that the community cadres have brought to the facilities without laboratories are reaching the laboratories? And my last bit, point pertains to integration and perhaps that's something that you and Jerry want to continue. Yeah. Over to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think uh, this pertains to human resources and um, that's why one of our observations was that um, planning for human resources for health has not been optimized and uh, we were recommending that uh, an, an assessment of the labor market for, for health be done. This is so that um, at least there will be optimization of uh, of a rationalization of how human resources are used, um, especially integrating um, service delivery. So, um, so that this is what um, we would recommend, so that at least we can see um, the workload issue being addressed in a more rationalized manner. And um, like um, uh, like Jabu said, I mean we are looking at at avoiding the verticalization of, of programming. So uh, we think if, if human resource um, gaps are addressed in, in, in a more rational manner, then we can see um, an improvement in this towards this uh, challenge. Thank you. Uh, Jabu, can yeah. I come in? Sorry, there was technical gates for the 25 number question. Uh, okay. First of all, thank you for the question. And uh, it's, very important that you see when you look at HIV TB or IPTP in HIV we're looking at pregnant women that is PMTCT and EID 
also the children. In TB, we are looking at specific treatment aspects for uh, pregnant women and IPTP. Already my uh, colleague Tom has. Now, we did see some good examples of the RMCH, uh, RMC, uh, NCAH programs being involved during the preparation of GF proposals this time. We did see the country dialogue where it was specifically mentioned. And we also saw in the funding requests, uh, some of the context of CHWs, where uh, specifically the maternal uh, health CHWs or the peer educators in certain places were being uh, integrated into the system as a basic uh, CHW or a basic health worker, were also involved in providing services for three diseases, not only that, for the whole gamut of RMA and CH programs. So that is some of the good examples we saw. But having said that, there's still a lot of way to go. And uh, we take your uh, comment and proposal and things in a positive spirit. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Dipanjan and colleagues. Just uh, we are top of the hour now, and uh, we had planned to end here. But recognizing that we still have quite a number of questions, probably a dozen or so, we're more than happy to continue. Uh, but for those colleagues that uh, want to jump off the call, uh, please feel free to do so. We are here and we'll continue if uh, you know people are interested in that. The recording for those that decide to uh, jump off the call uh, will be available on the Global Fund Island platform today or tomorrow, uh, so you can uh, have access access to that. I also noticed that uh, you know in question uh, 27, next page. Uh, colleagues are asking, you know, with so many questions, would it be possible to get written answers? Probably not directly written answers, but we are going to be putting together a consolidated uh, TRP lessons learned report for window one and window two. That's going to be presented to the strategy committee in October and published thereafter. So you will then be able to take a closer look at uh, the consolidated report, but I cannot commit that we will be able to provide uh, specific written responses to the to the questions, the recording will be available. So if that's okay, uh, I, I assume that we will have some colleagues that remain on the call. Uh, can I ask my TRP friends to pick up from question 28? And Rita, this comes again back to you, but there are also elements here about stigma and discrimination, which uh, um, uh, Naomi can, uh, can, can probably take a stab on. Uh, Rita, Rita, you're Rita, muted. We're, not, we're not hearing you. Okay, thank you. Is it better now? Yeah, on question yes. 28 on decentralization of TB services, especially DRTB, I think T, uh, TRP is seeing plenty of progress in most settings, particularly those settings that do not have the historic background of very centralized services for TB in general and particularly for this TB group, TB patient group. Um, we are also uh, seeing increasing uh, consideration of uh, funding requests expressing a balance between decent decentralization and further decentralization vis-a-vis -vis ensuring quality of uh, care, quality of TB treatment, access to uh, second-line drugs uh, further away from the treatment centers, as well as uh, side effect management. So I think we we are making progress in that regard. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. Naomi, is, I think there's been a renumbering. Thanks. 27, in, yeah. in relation to the the stigma component, um, where where we saw it is in we, it was very useful to have the TV guidance, which which referred to the you know interventions on stigma reduction and, and rights based approaches. I can't think of any um, single funding requests that had a particularly sophisticated framework or approach to integrating these interventions, but I know that uh, EHRG reviewers where they saw um, there was a plan that was kind of made without reference to rights-based approaches and without educating um, service providers on stigma, we made sure that we incorporated that in our recommendations. Yeah, and Tom, uh, maybe you want to pick up uh... The next question, two questions for you there. Let's get you busy a bit. Yeah. Yep, thanks. Uh, excellent question um, on uh, uh, switching from uh, IRS to LLINs and there being uh, 
large increases in cases as a result of this. So let me just clarify. So um, our observation was that at least two countries in window two, uh, which had uh, previously uh, used uh, wide scale IRS had actually made that uh, they themselves were switching uh, to uh, next generation nets, uh, particularly chlorofenafir uh, nets. Um, and so uh, the rationale was they were going to be able to cover more of their uh, uh, at-risk populations. Uh, but clearly that takes a lot of planning, uh, both, you know, it takes time to procure uh, both the chemicals for IRS, but as well as the nets. So, um, and so, and, and you know, as, as, as a TRP, both IRS and uh, nets and the next generation nets uh, are recommended strategies. So we are not making any type of recommendation that countries switch from IRS to NETS. Uh, the way I think we worded our recommendation was that countries uh, may wish to consider that uh, in light of, of, of major challenges in gaps in covering uh, vector control. So, um, and, then, and then to applicants, what our, what our um, sort of, uh, what we were focused on is that when countries have these large gaps, high burden countries in vector control, they're going to continue to use IRS. Uh, we're just wanting them to include a clear rationale, uh, if at all possible, being evidence-based or data-driven data as to why they're making that decision and leaving and continuing to have large gaps in vector control put into the PAR. Um, so I don't think we raised that flag with any country that we uh, suggested one way or the other, whether they use IRS or NETS. Uh, I, I do know that um, what we do follow closely is the normative guidance from WHO on combining IRS and NETS. And where there's sufficient resources, uh, we consider that. Um, uh, a, 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 but where there are insufficient resources and there's lack of justification, we may weigh in at that point and, 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 and make a recommendation to go down to one vector control tool. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next page, please. I think on the next page. Yeah, number 30, great uh, observation, but I, I think it goes, to, no, previous one. Yeah, it goes to and builds from uh, our observations in window one. You recall TRP made uh, very strong uh, observation about uh, challenges with prioritization. And this again speaks to what we all know that uh, you know, GC7 grants are going into a context of a, you know, a severely limited fiscal space. So there is clearly a funding issue that we are all aware of and uh, not everything uh, is going to be funded within the ambition of uh, you know, national programs, within the ambition of the global fund strategy itself. So this is something I think that we would put back to applicants uh, you know, recognizing country ownership, but also to partners to really look at how can applicants or countries be support, supported in prioritization. What we are seeing from our end, particularly in uh, window two, as we noted that we are seeing areas where there is uh, over ambition, we are seeing areas where there is under ambition, we are seeing greater use of data for prioritization. So I think that element is certainly coming out, but the challenge still remains the same that uh, with what we see accommodated within allocation, to the extent possible, TRP has also recommended some elements that may have been put in above allocation that needs to be prioritized. So that you'll be able to see on a, on a funding request by funding request from TRP comments. But I think this is an important question mainly around uh, what support can be provided to, to applicants uh, for, for, for proper prioritization. Malaria we saw you know, in window one, front loading of commodities, we are seeing the same again, probably not as acute as we saw in, in, window, in window one, but it's certainly still coming up in window two. Tom has just spoken about challenges in terms of uh, you know uh, bed nets, you know when do you use uh, dual AI nets? So those questions I think are, are much broader questions speaking to uh, fiscal space and challenges in prioritization. Uh, w, um, we can you speak to whether there's certain elements of the funding request, either annexes or, or questions being seen and, and prioritization about what goes into the funding request itself? about what goes into the funding the funding request the, the annexes the forms i think that that's that's it i mean we we 
applicant, that's a country decision, right? No. To, to so the, require, the requirements package. within the, the funding request yeah. package. I'm not sure I'm getting the question. The, the yeah. package, whether the package overall should be reviewed, yeah. what the documentation is. There. Yeah, you can go ahead. You're on three. Um, so I think that on, in terms of the overall package of application documentation that is being requested from uh, applicants, uh, that is something that we have to go through the whole funding cycle in order to see uh, what might be sharpened in, in the documentation that is requested um, and maybe even differentiated further uh, across the different portfolios of the request. I think that we are not ready really to yeah. answer in full. The TRP has been involved in supporting the Global Fund Secretariat to define the application components, but I think that there are quite few lessons also to be learned. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, clear, clearly, you know, this this is gonna be you know country specific. I mean, to but in terms of guidance, uh, maybe Robin, you want to speak to uh, what TRP expects to see within the the, the, the funding request package. But I, I don't think there's you know kind of you know, one size fits all. It's gonna have to be tailored to country context. It's gonna have to be tailored to the modality that you are using for application. But uh, over to you, Robin. Thanks. So. Um... Thanks for the question. It's a really important one. And we did have a working group of the TRP that um, consulted with, who were in consultation with the Secretariat as they evolved this new application process. And I think all of us had the same ambition that we did not have overly lengthy applications. That hasn't entirely been uh, realized. And I think that the message we might give to applicants is to make sure that the information is contained in the application package, but it doesn't all have to be um, repeated in the main funding request uh, documentation. If it's there in the annexes and they are completing all of the required parts of the funding request. So we have seen, um, for example, um, in focus portfolios where we expect shorter, more condensed applications, we've seen very lengthy applications still coming in. So I think the, the message really to applicants would be that we do consider and look at every Every single annex that we receive and that's part of our review process but um, we would encourage you to have not too much duplication and we will I'm sure be working with the Secretariat in advance of GC8 to see if there can be further refinements um, but I think this is as Jabu has said very much a country by country issue about making sure that the the main document is clear and focused on the prioritization that is relevant to that particular applicant and the supporting material is provided to us as annexes. Mm. And what, what might also be useful is the global fund uh, survey of uh, feedback from applicants on uh, GC7 uh, funding requests. So maybe this is something to also defer to Secretariat on what's coming out in terms of the uh, feedback. But certainly for, for TRP, we acknowledge that there is a, a burden on applicants to pull together the funding requests and we want to you know, support in streamlining that as much as possible. But at the same time, streamlining also comes with the challenges of limited information to TRP. So I think it's gonna to have to be you know, a balancing act here in, in terms of what is essential that can be provided. We had hoped that with the new application materials and the new approach, you know, this would be a lot more, a lot, a lot more streamlined. But again, this is a question that we defer more broadly to, to the Secretariat. TRP is only part of that process, but there are quite a number of stakeholders that are obviously involved. Public contracting, social contracting, this comes up again. Uh, Raminda, do you want to sp speak briefly to this? Your... So there has been quite a few, I think three global consultations on uh, the subject in, in the context of HIV, TB and malaria. And there has been quite few discussions how to define it, like even what term to use it. So I think that for Global Fund, it's important uh, to be aligned with other partners, uh, but I will remind that the TRP is using the Global Fund um, STC, the Sustainability Transition and Co-Financing uh, Policy and Guidance Note, uh, in which the Global Fund uses the wording public financing of civil society organizations, service delivery and sustainability. Um, in that context. So we are really following in that context the Global Fund guidance, but we understand that the Global Fund is not the only one who's work, uh, which is working and um, this alignment is always important, but I understand that social contracting sometimes in some contexts is misunderstood. Therefore, um, the broader term and defining what we are talking about is very important. It's about public 
contracting mechanism and public financing that is going for CSO services. Then uh, 32, I mean, it may be specific to HIV cascades and missing information in essential data tables, uh, but I mean, it, it, it clearly presents a challenge when you know, that information is missing, not only for, for HIV, but across the board. So I think again here, we call on uh, you know, uh, applicants themselves, the broader you know, uh, uh, secretary uh, colleagues and the technical partners, the extent to which you know, this information should be available or, or, or provided. Uh, is the Global Fund going to file such recommendation directly to the respective? Uh, again, I think this is something that uh, uh, we, we will defer to, to Secretariat. Here we're flagging a, a major gap in uh, what we are seeing. And I think going beyond uh, you know, EDTs, we highlighted already that uh, you know, quite a number of uh, funding landscape tables, programmatic uh, you know, uh, 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 gap analysis tables, we are still seeing you know, uh, quite some substantial uh, gaps in information that would have uh, provided TRP to have a much broader view on uh, uh, what's happening in country. We are seeing the same. We've uh, highlighted this in window one, in window two, the RSSH annex again. Whilst the intention is great to give us a greater view of who is supporting what within the uh, health systems, there are still, still gaps you know, in terms of uh, giving us that visibility into funding. You may have lists of uh, you know, areas uh, in RSSH that are being supported or being prioritized, but we are finding uh, you know, missing information on the funding aspect and linking of uh, RSSH annex, for instance, with the with the funding landscape table. So I think this is something that would have to come back to to partners uh, and and secretariat in terms of how how we we address this. And uh, specifically in terms of the grant making stage, uh, the essential data tables is not it's updated not of it, yeah. during grant making. Yeah. Then uh, next page. Um, yeah. Mal malaria matchbox and tailoring to malaria interventions. This I'll defer both to uh, Naomi and, uh, and, and Tom. After you, Tom. Sorry? Uh, I don't know who, I, I can just say from a malaria standpoint, technical standpoint that um, it's been an evolution from our observation and I, I'd like to hear more from our e uh, HRG colleagues, I expect Naomi. Um, so, you know, in, in GC uh, 6, there was recommendations to, for countries to fund and implement malaria matchbox assessments if they had not done so. Many countries have done that, but I think uh, in some countries, in window two in particular, have gone further in, in using those results to inform the malaria programming, but I think we clearly think that uh, countries could go a lot further in using uh, th th those those results. But uh, let me let me turn it over to you, Naomi. Thanks, Tom. Um, everything you just said. I think uh, in in window two, we were really pleased to see the malaria matchbox, where where the assessment was used to inform programming really help, help uh, applicants to identify and, and respond to the specific vulnerabilities and equity issues around malaria, which are different to TB and HIV, as everybody knows. Thanks. Yeah. And Tom, if you stay there, I think I know we had uh, lots of uh, debate discussion uh, on question number 34. Yeah, if I, if I understand the question, it's this, it's this uh, combination of trying to expand malaria programming to the extent possible to cover gaps uh, in, in treatment and vector control prevention, and then maintaining uh, a quality, uh, malaria program quality. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a tricky, contextually based series of decisions that programs have to make and put into their funding request. Uh, I would definitely say there is a not a one-size-fits-all approach to this complex issue. Uh, with respect to new tools, uh, particularly with uh, drug resistance and insecticide resistance, we uh, follow WHO normative guidance in our reviews. Um, if, if a country, uh, and we've seen this in both window one and window two, uh, or start the planning of introducing a second first-line antimalarial drug, uh, to mitigate in, uh, uh, drug resistance. Um, I think the, the only uh, 
thing that the TRP would weigh in on is whether there's a clearly articulated plan for that to happen because it doesn't happen overnight. It involves uh, working with technical partners and involves updating uh, national treatment guidelines and so forth. But, but, but that's as far as, as, as we would go uh, from my reading. And uh, I would say similarly for, for um, uh, dual active ingredient nets, particularly with chlorofinapir, um, where there's evidence of, of pre-thoid resistance, we follow WHO normative guidance that uh, they should use uh, nets that are effective in that context. Where there's not data, it becomes a bit trickier, uh, especially in uh, the context where there's large gaps in vector control. So I would say that 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 overall, we take this on a case by case basis and try to uh, you know uh, uh, you know it, the, the best the best case scenario is there's there's lots of justification and in, in data to to sort of support the decisions that the funding requests uh, 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 articulate. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. And, and again, beyond uh, this question, beyond um, uh, malaria, uh, really amplifies the first thematic observation that we made, you know, the balance, getting the right balance between over and under ambition in targets and Ramita did, did speak to this. But we, 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 we cannot, you know, really provide uh, a simple solution to this. This is something that would have to be taken back to countries, to uh, technical partners. How do we get that balance right between applying, scaling up new tools, and also making sure that you know the core is still still maintained? We've seen examples where new tools are you know introduced, uh, say in HIV prevention, but we are seeing countries also lagging you know back, say in in condom programming. So I think I think that 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 balance is something that we have noticed. Uh, as, as a bit of a challenge, and again, maybe it speaks to uh, you know the the limited uh, you know funding envelope, but certainly an area that uh, that's going to require you know significant uh, support and technical assistance to to applicants going forward. Uh, I think we'll uh, we'll end here uh, in our, our Q and A, and uh, once again, just to appreciate those colleagues that have stayed on uh, the numerous questions that you've posed to us. Certainly, uh, you know, really helpful. But uh, before closing. On behalf of TRP, we want to, you know, spe specifically appreciate the efforts from uh, country partners, from applicants in pulling together the funding requests. We know that this is a huge effort. You know, when we sit here in TRP and review over two weeks, yes, there is quite a, a lot of work that goes into that, but we cannot underestimate the support that has been provided by technical partners, the Global Fund Secretariat, to ensure that these, uh, uh, you know, applications come through to TRP. And uh, so we, we, we really appreciate you for that. And my TRP colleagues, thank you very much for the hard work that you've done over the past two weeks in lockdown. Thank you.